Today we have with us Dr. Kostov Banerjee, Associate Professor, Global Studies, Ambedkar University. Uh, sir, I would like you to throw some light on the entire struggle which you've been through. Uh, what has been your strive for and what are you fighting for currently? Okay. You see, uh, this, this center, when it was started, you know, it faced a lot of uh, opposition in a certain sense because, of course, we were going to study discrimination and exclusion and not everybody was very comfortable with it. Also the fact that the School of Social Sciences in JNU anyway had so many departments working on similar issues. I think the usual question was why another centre? But we felt that when we started, uh, I joined in 2013 and when we started the centre and the MPhil PhD programmes, there was a kind of a struggle to get the centre started in the first place. Of course, uh, one of the first flashpoints was that, you know, in JNU we called our centre the Centre for the Study of Discrimination and Exclusion, yeah. while the UGC had a policy looking at our model itself, and they called it the Centre for the Study of Social Exclusion and Inclusive Policy. policy. If you remember, the inclusive policy was the claim of the government during the 10th plan. Okay. Now, we didn't want to be a mouthpiece for the government, hence, uh, we called ourselves differently, as most centres in JNU are. Now, from that time, the struggle was a to attract bright students and to have a research programme which would essentially look at multifaceted uh, processes of discrimination and exclusion. And from that time, the government tried, uh, the UGC tried thrice, to shut the centre down. Of course, we fought, we wrote in the papers, uh, there were a lot of uh, activists and professors and the academic community came together and the centre was not stopped. Now, finally in 2017, when the, so our extensions was to the end of the plan. As you know, the plan, the planning commission was shut down and the plan period was over. Okay. So till 2017 March, we had an extension. And then they gave us an extension. They tried shutting us down, and there was a big furor in the papers, which a lot of people would have read. But then UGC claimed that that was a forged letter. And I think from then, this plan was afoot how to shut this center down. Of course, Panchajani had also spoken about, you know, leftists and Christian missionaries being in these centers and trying to corrupt the mind of educated classes, etc., etc. But Again, given the public furor, the centre was given an extension for one year. But very curiously, they shut down, they, they brought down the extension to six months. Interestingly, in, when they give, give, gave us an extension in March, they stopped paying us from April. And we went without salaries for four months, okay. till they finally brought out the uh, extension notice in July. But it was just for six months. So we had an extension till 30th of September, 2017. Now, given the fact that we were tenure posts, and uh, that's also interesting because when I was first offered the job, I was offered the job as a permanent position. And they withdrew, uh, so that time I was teaching the Center for Development Studies in Trivandrum. And I resigned there based on the permanent letter. And very interestingly, JNU withdrew that letter 25 days after saying, sorry, we made a mistake, it's a tenure post. Anyways, the vice chancellor then uh, had told me, no, it's a permanent post, so I came over. And uh, since I knew that this extension thing was going to be a problem, all of us knew, the four of us, we started the centre. When I joined in 2013, there was one PhD student. Mm. We didn't, we had one room, mm. thanks to the sociology centre. Centre for Study of Social Systems would give us one room and we started from there and now we have 70 students and uh, since I knew that this problem was going to constantly crop up this was actually placed in the school and to the Vice Chancellor and the School of Social Sciences very kindly gave us two uh, posts to permanentize the situation in, through a proper process but the interviews, sadly, were never held because uh, the centre would stall the process every time. 
So just the chairperson of the center is permanent and the rest were not. So this was a situation that was running. And the interviews finally were held under this new regime in October. So 30th of September, our tenures came to an end. 13th of October were the uh, interviews for the post. Mm -hmm. One post was for political economy. One was for anthropology. They hired people who didn't have those qualifications or from the discipline. Okay. And uh, this was, as uh, you know, was held under the new dean. Okay. So anyway, so on the 13th of October, we already, while we had gone for the interview, we already knew the names of the two people who were going to get get through. Okay. And uh, so I knew it was a lost case. And though I appeared for the interview after that. Mm -hmm. and. On this, uh, on, th on the 17th of October, UGC finally gave the extension. Okay. Now, so I think the plan was to actually ease us out after the 30th of September by not giving us an extension and hiring their own people. But finally, on the 17th, unknown to the JNU administration, UGC gave us an extension. Now, UGC gave this extension to all the 35 centers. So we thought we had a breather because now again the extension would come through. But since they had hired two people in our positions, in the permanent positions, they then thought the best way to do this is to stop the salaries so that you can, we can be pushed up. Now interestingly, that's where the struggle actually starts in a different way because it's not just an external thing. We were disallowed from going to faculty meetings for 10 months okay. and there was a lot of indignity that we had to face and discrimination in the center okay. with studies discrimination yes. and exclusion but i held on because i had eight students who were doing their phd and mphil under me and i didn't think uh, it's fair to put my students into that kind of a situation and uh, this went on and in April, finally, this year, I appeared, I mean, I appeared for the interview in Ambedkar University and I got the job in April. But I held on only because my students were submitting in July. And so I held on till then. And I left, I resigned on the 31st of July after my students, there were two PhD students and six MPhil students who submitted their MPhils and PhDs in the third week of July. After that, I resigned and I left. So I think they accepted my resignation and they gave me a clearance jail on the last day that also they weren't sure because they weren't sure whether i was actually leaving or not okay. but when they were sure that i was they actually gave me a clearance very illegally without clearing my dues and uh, in fact i was also the warden of a hostel okay. uh, and hence i had asked that i could could I stay for two more months because it's allowed to stay for three months or six months. They took a market rate of rent from me, 40,000 rupees, and they took out, took that money. And I said, you could first pay me and do that. They said, no, this is, these are separate things. After listening to your elaboration, sir, uh, I really want to figure out here, can you please uh, make us understand a little bit more that why was it necessary, why was it important to have a center? for social exclusion and discrimination in the school of social sciences right. which already studies so many discrimination sociology studies right. you have right. certificate studies which studies the similar Absolutely. kind of things Absolutely. so how how much different was the center from and how important was it to have that center in the social sciences building right you see it's an old debate i'll, I'll give you an example from from the experience of women's studies okay. centers. You see, when the Center for Women's Studies was coming in, everybody said we study gender. Sure. Okay, so what is the requirement for having a separate one? Mm -hmm. But of course there's a requirement for having a separate women's studies center because that ways you can actually, the idea is as a center, you can then infuse all the other disciplines with that perspective. Similarly, Center for Study of Discrimination and Exclusion, it's not as if sociology or political science or history wasn't looking at these kind of things. But to have a, a center means you concentrate all your energies on that and then it dissipates into all other centers. So the idea was to look at these processes, not just as a historical perspective, 
but as a contemporary phenomenon okay. and as processes that were happening in our everyday lives mm -hmm. something that the center which was only looking at this kind of situation would do is it would attract a lot of bright minds as well as a lot of research would actually happen on that kind of issues which would then spill over so it's like an idea of a crucible so it, it first contains and nurtures this and then it kind of spreads this space into all else. so that was the idea okay. uh, uh, how this was started this was in fact this was a novel idea this was uh, something that kind of happened in JNU in 2000 in the early 2000s when this uh, the conversation in the school of social sciences I was at that point of time a student uh, happened around the idea that there should be a program which should study discrimination and exclusion and that should be housed in the school of social sciences we became a center much later when we joined but it was it was a program and of course everybody in the beginning said why do we need a separate one mm -hmm. but the idea of why a separate one would be required is to look at contemporary processes and history of marginalization and bring this together okay so that's how the program started now i think the government of the day at that point of time found that idea pretty interesting and the ugc at that point of time took this up and floated this idea it's very similar to a lot of cases that's, that happens with JNU, similar to the student union elections, like mm -hmm. the LinkedIn recommendations were based, look, looking at JNU as a model, but then they turned it around. The same thing, uh, this program for the study of discrimination and exclusion was an interesting idea. They took it and then they formed it, they, they made it into a scheme like UGC does, like women's studies, where we had a similar thing, which was called the Center for the Study of social exclusion and inclusive policy and that was in the 10th plan and from there started the funding of these centers there are 35 such centers across the country and i must say that this situation of non-regular faculty and not regular payment happens unfortunately in social exclusion centers so after listening to your narrative we can understand that your fight has been with the administration and the administrative setup particularly so in that milieu, how easy or difficult it was for you as an academician to deal with an administration which is not at all ready to listen to the demands and the uh, demands and the aspirations of the employees, uh, employees and intellectuals and teachers like you. Well, you see, it's in a certain sense, it's the the enemy or the the. The attack is not just from outside, there are internal forces as well. So it's a combination of external, the external ecosystem as well as people inside okay. who I think take advantage of the fact that this is a situation like this and they proceed. So without the internal, so as to speak, people, this situation wouldn't have prevailed. Now, okay. for example, uh, I, I think it's extremely sad that we were disallowed from attending faculty meetings for 10 months. Now, how do we democratically have decision making in a center mm. which involves the lives of 70 students so, yeah. and research? And we are primarily a uh, MPhil PhD, that, that, that means we are a research teaching center. Right. How do, what happens to the lives of those students? Right. Uh, and how, how do we actually talk about the research if you kind of exclude uh, in a three, with three colleagues? So if two colleagues are excluded from uh, attending uh, faculty meetings for 10 months, mm -hmm. I, I think it becomes very difficult to kind of get your point across. But of course, what Jamie has taught me and still teaches me is your lifeline is your student. So I continue teaching. Uh, I continued supervising. Of course, my students had a very tough time because even their papers or their you know routine matters would get stalled and delayed uh, just because they're my students. And I, I realized that this is a very sad state of affairs. And I 
I, I kept thinking over those 10 months that, you know, it, they want me out, that's one thing, but I, I hope this witch hunting doesn't continue with my students just because they are my students. And that's something that has troubled me all along. The, I think when, when the present JNU administration, anyway, this JNU administration has no respect for academics, so we weren't expecting them to follow any modicum of decorum, academic or otherwise. So, and when they changed the dean of the school, I mean, they superseded five senior professors and made the present dean the dean. We knew what we were for, in for. And so, none of the procedures, academic procedures, were going to be followed. What was unfortunate is inside our center, the same, so seeing the chance outside, I think inside the center, the same kind of ploy was also put in. But I knew that. It's okay, if, even if you don't go for faculty meetings, you teach and you do research and it's fine. So you can continue doing that. But I think the breaking point started coming when we knew that the interviews were going to be held and we, we kind of were hearing horror stories in other centers. Right. So we already had some clue that this is going to be the case. So it went to the next extent that, I mean, I hate saying it like this, but they would so I realized that I have to get out because this is what they're going to do. So after one point of time, they even, they, you know, if you apply outside in another university, you need what is called a no objection, no objection certificate. certificate. They refuse to give no objection certificate. Okay. So it was to keep you bonded in a situation where neither can you escape that, escape. nor are you, and you live a life of indignity within that institution. Right. When we realized that this is going to continue, I had... I had, as an economist, I, I understood the fact that if they can't take us out like this, they would stop the salaries. They had done that once uh, from March uh, 2017 to July. And I knew this was what is going to happen in September. So I was kind of mentally prepared they would do the worst possible things. So we wrote letters, we requested meetings, but uh, and the only meeting in those earlier times last year that the uh, vice chancellor and the rector very graciously granted us, we were told straight on our faces that why don't you look for other jobs. So after listening to your narrative and also the kind of cases which have come up in the recent times like the ICC judgment and the entire narratives of, a narrative of shunning academics etc. There's, there's a rhetoric of shrinking university spaces in, to, in today's time. So in such uh, in, in this kind of an atmosphere, how important is it for an academician to upheld their academic autonomy in order to function properly and cater to the academic world in a larger context? In that sense, I think they, they, they were terribly unhappy with me because I was a member of the gender uh, of, uh, of GS Cash, uh, the Gender Sensitization yeah, right. Committee on Sexual Harassment, and we had kind of rewritten the rules. Okay. Uh, and they didn't want to adopt that for obvious reasons. So I think they especially didn't like me because I was part of that frame. And uh, also, I think uh, in their long list of Takeoffs. I was also a concurrent faculty in the Centre for Women's Studies, so you can imagine the kind in the issue. the patriarchal mindset that they have, they they can't they can't stand certain kinds of principles. So I guess as an academician, I have and I continue doing what I have to do, but uh, I think it it doesn't it rubs the wrong way with Some this kind of administration. Dr. Kostic. It was nice talking to you. Thank you so much for being with us.